So there's a mixed reception from some people that Lewis respected deeply, friends, about the Narnia books. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's that about? Yeah, he read the first few chapters of the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, to his friend Tolkien. And Tolkien didn't much like what he was hearing. Mm. Tolkien thought the books had been thrown together a bit haphazardly. Uh, if you know Tolkien's Middle Earth, that's a very different kind of imagined space. It's very rigorous and thoroughgoing, and it has what he called the inner consistency of reality. Narnia, by contrast, looks a little bit slapdash. Things drawn together from all sorts of different mythological literary traditions. Got the classics and fairy tale and E. e- Nesbitt sort of Edwardian stories and uh, Father Christmas is in there and Tolkien didn't like it. Mm. And because Tolkien has become famous, uh, his attitude to Narnia has become famous and Lots of people have sort of followed in Tolkien's wake and thought that Tolkien knew the series much better than he actually did. And so they've sort of jumped on the bandwagon and thought, oh yeah, Narnia's not very good, is it? It's just thrown together in an afternoon and um, it shouldn't be taken very seriously. But I think that's entirely wrong. Yeah. Uh, Why? (laughs) (laughs) Well, because Lewis was not a random or a slapdash writer or thinker. You know, he had one of the most disciplined and trained and controlled intellects of the 20th century. He didn't do anything uh, casually or thoughtlessly. Um, So Narnia... That argument won't quite do, though, because Tolkien knew Lewis Mm -hmm. as a friend Mm -hmm. for decades. And so the fact that Lewis was or was not like that does not prove about this book. True. I'm leading you to the assertion that you have proved about the book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, as I say, Tolkien dismissed the books quite quickly. You know, he only read or had read to him the first few chapters of the first book, and he, you know, threw up his hands in horror and turned away. And he was a hard man to please, Tolkien. He disliked nearly everything that Lewis wrote, actually. Um, (laughs) Whereas Lewis, in contrast, loved The Lord of the Rings and badgered Tolkien endlessly to finish it. Um, So it was a love-hate relationship they had. Lewis loved Tolkien's works, and Tolkien hated Lewis's work. <laughs> <laughs> That's an um, odd basis for a friendship, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> well, they, they were in some ways chalk and cheese, um, but, you know, opposites attract. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the Narnia books are, are not casually thrown together. They are, they are structured, I believe. This is the discovery I made when I was doing my doctoral research on Lewis's imagination. They're structured according to the seven heavens, the seven planets of medieval cosmology, which Lewis, as a medieval scholar, knew all about, and which he described as spiritual symbols of permanent value, which were especially worthwhile in his own generation. And it's those seven heavens from which we get the names of the days of the week. So the sun, the moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn, these seven planets with their seven sets of attributes and qualities and influences. That's what provided Lewis with his scheme, his blueprint, his, his imaginative design. Now we're going to explore that at length. But before we do, you make an amazing statement, uh, which apparently is true, in your book. Uh, Lewis hid that fact. Mm. Why would he do that? Well, he wrote a lot about the planets in other works. He wrote about them academically in his book, The Discarded Image, you know, tracing them historically through literature and art. He wrote about them very explicitly in his trilogy of planetary adventures, sometimes called the Space Trilogy, but that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's better to call it the the Ransom Trilogy. And, you know, uh, there the seven heavens are are used very obviously. He wrote about them too in his poetry. But he thought that the best way to understand the planets, their qualities, their attributes, their personalities, was, was not through laboriously listing all their, all their particular uh, qualities, but by seizing them in an intuition. Like you might smell a rose or taste a wine and immediately recognize it. That's the best way of knowing these 
planetary personalities. And so in Narnia, he doesn't tell us what he's up to. And if he had disclosed the secret, it would have you know, frustrated the very thing he was trying to achieve. So that's why it was underhand, as it were, under but the But it would have been a perfect answer to Tolkien, right? Yeah. But then I think Lewis didn't really much care what the, what Tolkien thought if you know because <laughs> <that> I'm... <laughs> you know that there you go again tollers would be the sort of response I think and in any case you know an artist who has to explain his art mm -hmm. in order for it to you know be uh, judged worthy um, has failed so I don't think Lewis would have felt under any uh, he wouldn't have felt incumbent upon him to explain himself. You know, if, if it's not if it's not Tolkien's uh, pigeon, it's not Tolkien's pigeon. 